a great event, everybody. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're excited to host tonight's event with Adam Meyer presenting his new book, You Can Keep That to Yourself, a comprehensive list of what not to say to Black people for well-intentioned people of power. He will be talking with Irma Herrera, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Adam, Irma, and the team at Akashic for making this happen, and thanks to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a couple of housekeeping things to go over. Uh, in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. So the exact location will depend on what type of device you're using. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. So if you have specific questions you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two little speech balloons. Uh, we'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. So please make sure that you're putting them there um, and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, You Can Keep That to Yourself, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to be able to offer in-store shopping in our bookstore locations from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. And you can purchase Adam's books and book and many others on site or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer for this evening is Irma Herrera. She is a San Francisco Bay Area based writer and solo performer. Irma's one woman show, Why Would I Mispronounce My Own Name, weaves historic and comedic insights into stories about names and has received critical acclaim from reviewers and audiences. Irma spent three decades as a social justice lawyer working at the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund and Equal Rights Advocates, among others. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Distinction Award given by the ABA Commission of Women in the Profession. While sheltering in place, Irma launched her video-based stairwell theatro series telling stories from La Scala, the stairwell at her home. She'll be speaking with our featured author, Adam Smyer, he is an attorney, martial artist, and mediocre bass player. His nonfiction has appeared in the Johannesburg Review of Books, and his debut novel, Knucklehead, was the sole title shortlisted for the 2018 Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. Meyer lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with his wife and cat. His new book, You Can Keep That to Yourself, is a much-needed guidebook for well-intentioned people of color on what not to say to their African-American friends. Hilarious and provocative, this handy field guide is, as Publishers Weekly puts it, designed to strip away the hypocrisy of these half-truths and these cultural exchanges by laughing at them. Meyer's hilarious sample, sampler offers astute observations on race and culture. Adam is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Irma and with all of you. Please take it away, Adam. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you, Greenlight. Thank you, Akashic. Uh, thank you all for being here, and most of all, uh, thank you for the guy who's banging on my door, but also thank you, Irma, for hosting this. I've been super excited to talk to you. Um, I'm a huge fan, but uh, here we go. We're starting off very beginning, if you can keep that to yourself. Hello, well-intentioned person of pallor. It's Daquan, the Black coworker you were referring to when you claim to have Black friends. You are reading this book because you want to know what not to say. They get mad at you when you say the wrong thing, but no one will tell you up front what not to say. Well, I will tell you, because I am your friend, your real black friend. I will tell you what not to say, but I will not tell you what not to think. Think whatever you like. Let's review. Thoughts are the things on the inside of your head. They are invisible. Your thoughts are yours, no one else's. No one else wants them. Words are the things that exit your hole to the outside of your head where we are. They are a lot like thoughts, except that we can hear them. We don't want most of those either. You can keep them. 
Here is every word that you should keep to yourself. It's helpfully alphabetized. So very first entry here is ally. Well-intentioned people of pallor went seamlessly from not seeing color to being allies. Being part of the problem was never considered. And really, ally was fine for a while. It was aspirational. But now, I'm an ally is the don't hurt me of our time. Don't nobody want you, Karen. You can keep that to yourself. Thank you so much, Adam. I was so thrilled when I went down to the post mailbox by my house and got this today, several copies of it. So I'm super excited. I had gotten a preview copy, so I was able to read it and um, enjoy it very much. Now, many of us walk around with a list of words in our head that make our backs stiff and cause us to uh, shudder a bit. But we don't typically write those words down into a book, but you did. <laughs> yes, we when typically did you start don't do that. that? Oh, wow. Um, it started suddenly, uh, probably over a year ago, because publishing, you know how publishing is, these things take time. So I would say at least a year ago, I started making a list. Uh, I, I didn't know how this was going to end up but I did know I wanted to collect those specific thoughts, that idea, I did want to make a definitive list. And so the first was just the list and then I began to flush it out and run it by people and refine it. And you have how many words in your book? I haven't counted, but it's, I don't know, at least two per letter. Uh, it's at least I, one per letter, probably an average of two. The whole book is, it's surprising. It's like 130 something pages. Yeah, but isn't it cute? It's a tiny, it's little adorable. Tiny. It's <laughs> tiny and it's really cute. Well, let's unpack the world, the word ally, because I see racial justice organizations using that word. I see them offering trainings and people wanting the alliance or the allyship of, of folks. And in today's Sporting Green, the local sports section of the San Francisco newspaper. There's an article about the coach of the Golden State Warriors, Steve Kerr, is arguably African Americans' biggest ally among white NBA head coaches. And it talks about all he's doing to raise awareness and to be active. So we are seeing that so many people are engaged in the social justice fight right now. And I think Folks want to know, do we call ourselves something if we're not black people? Do they? Okay, so I guess a disclaimer up front. The book is satire. I do appreciate that people are finding actual value in it, but I wouldn't presume to critically justify every word or reaction that makes up the book. That said, as far as that issue goes, I was just kind of thinking about what you're saying because it's true, it's something of a trap, right? You have to have a language to discuss these things. And, 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 and ally was aspirational and people, some people do want to be allies. And if we can't call them that, what do we find a synonym and then use that? Remember the safety pins, the, the safety pins were a thing for a while. How do you say that? And then just sitting here just now listening to you, I kind of thought of an idea that and, and this is kind of counter to the overall trend right now, but maybe ally is a word that we don't use to self-identify. Maybe that's a term that has to be conferred. Maybe the, the, the newspaper piece is correct. I guess what I've become skeptical of is people declaring it to me about themselves. Uh-huh. So I did a little research on the word and I found an essay that was written by Roxane Gay four years ago that appeared in Marie Claire, and it's called Making Black Lives Matter. And I love what she said. Black people do not need allies. We need people to stand up and take on the problems born of oppression as their own without remove or distance. We need people to do this, even if they cannot fully understand what it's like to be oppressed for their race or ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, class, religion, or other markers of identification. We need people to use common sense 
to figure out how to participate in social justice. And to me, that really captured what I think we are looking for. We want people to say, this is my fight too. It matters to me. I can care deeply about gay rights and trans rights without being a person with that identity. Absolutely. So. It's, it's, it's an action, not a label, is a lot of what I was taking from that. I love Roxanne Gay and I love everything she says. And, and I was reminded of, uh, was it, um, now I'm gonna mangle uh, Toni Morrison. Didn't she say something about, uh, there are those who will hide me when the time comes and those who won't, something to that effect that like we, we assess people that, well, will this person hide me in their attic or <laughs> six months from now? And that's real, it's extremely real. Does it, does it come with a, a, a label that you get to throw around and make you feel good for your, about yourself? Maybe not. Okay, let's move on to another favorite word of mine, articulate. Can you read us the definition? <laughs> this one was the very first one I wrote. Interestingly, this is <laughs> the first item on my list. <laughs> articulate. Wow, you think to yourself, this black man talking to me is so articulate. You mean it as a compliment. You can keep it to yourself. That black man is the judge in your DUI trial. Maybe let your lawyer do the talking. I love, I love your um, explanations, definitions, the humor in them, and the truth when people say to us who are trained talkers, right? You're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. This is what we do. We use words, we write words, we say words, we talk for a living. And so it should be a given that we would be articulate. I've had pushback from friends, people uh, who are good people, that they mean it as the highest compliment. And this brings me to the question of intent versus impact. Say a little bit about that. Well, the, the one thing I, I have to get off my chest, and this is ordinarily not something I would say, but this is my event, so I'm going to say it. Um, I have had the experience, and others I know have had the experience of trying to talk to somebody about something, and then uh, just kind of realizing that there's something, there's some sort of disconnect as far as the visual cue that that the, the, the face I'm talking to um, seems distracted or confused. And a friend of mine described that facial expression as it can talk. And so that's, I guess, taken to uh, the, the, the extreme of that idea. If a person is in existential crisis because I'm speaking to them, that's a problem. I'm sorry, I forgot your question. Well, it was the intent versus impact of one's word. So someone may intend to compliment you by saying you're so articulate, but if you don't receive it that way, it's important for that person to know that their intent is overshadowed by the actual impact of their word. We don't like it. Most people of color don't like it when people call us articulate. In fact, I, I, I feel like I would go so far as to say that what you just described was the state of affairs in 2016. Post 2016, I've come to think of intent as largely irrelevant because uh, good intentions don't seem to have stopped uh, a lot of bad things from happening. I'm starting to question their efficacy besides making the, the bearer of them feel good and not responsible. So I had a, a, a funny incident involving the word articulate. A friend wrote an email to a group of us saying she'd been watching Governor Newsom's daily briefings on the coronavirus and he's so articulate and she wrote me privately and said oh my god was i insensitive to call governor <laughs> articulate and i i wrote her back i said i think it's okay to call a white man articulate and then she wrote back but you know he has dyslexia he has a you know reading disorder so it's hard for him to be prepared and do all this reading and i thought case proven Less is expected of someone with a disability, whether it's your color and people perceive you as less able than, 
in one form or another, but we can move on from articulate. We can put that one to rest. I think that there's a growing uh, acceptance that this is not a word that we should probably utter out loud. I've okay. heard a, a workaround, eloquent. Eloquent is starting to become popular and it, and it doesn't grate yet. So it's all the okay. same issues, but it doesn't, it doesn't grate. So there's that. All right, well, I'm gonna move on to a word that um, I think we all know why it's not an okay word, grandfathered in. So many people are telling me they had no idea what that one was about. I mean, maybe that's the law connection, right? Maybe we, you know, we were exposed to some of the backstory to those things in a way that other people weren't. And, and in fairness, you know, there are so many things about our language and culture that have bloody, bloody roots. It seems like every Ken Burns documentary I watch, he could do something about marshmallows and it would, you know, marshmallows were invented to roast at lynchings. I don't know, but Ken Burns, it, everything he touches turns into horrible, horrible, bloody racist violence. And so, uh, but people didn't know uh, about grandfathered. I knew, I mean, I, yeah. So uh, do you want me to read that one? Or? Yeah, please. It, it doesn't contain a lot of backstory. And this, I, I did not, I did not write this to educate people. I wrote this to validate those who uh, live this. And so it, it, it's kind of implied, you know, if you, if you want to know more, uh, look, go to Google. Grandfather it in. Find some way to explain how we're going to get around that new regulation, other than by casually evoking the state-sponsored disenfranchisement of Black people that continues to this day. It's bad enough that I'm sitting in a meeting. Yeah, and it's a term, as lawyers, we've heard our whole training and our whole career. So when I was reading the advanced copy and I came to the word dark. I thought, oh, no, Adam, not that. <laughs> you like that one, huh? <laughs> dark. Why don't you read your explanation of dark, and then I'll tell you something about that. Let's talk about dark. None of these are not, I don't, I don't intend these to be, you know, simple. <laughs> this isn't a, a book of slurs. This is the gray area, right? So, ooh, gray area. Okay, dark. You use light and dark, black and white imagery, to signify good and evil while you were talking to me, a black person. You don't even hear yourself. Some bowl cut translucent psycho commits a horror and the first thing you call him is dark. Keep us out of your fuckery. <laughs> so I was talking with a friend about all the good things that Zoom brings, like I can participate in a bookstore event in New York, sitting in my home in Northern California. And then I said, you know, but the dark side of it, and I stopped myself and I said, well, unfortunately, not everyone has access to, you know, all these events. If you don't have good Wi-Fi, if, you know, if you're a kid and your parents are poor and you're expected to do school via Zoom, but you don't have bandwidth or there aren't four computers in your house. But I caught myself and I felt really proud. So thank you. But yes, <laughs> language, language shapes our world. Words, words define how we see the world around us. And so they are super important. They are. Now, I don't see color. How many times have I heard that and often it is said to explain to you how fair-minded this person is. And it's I've very always, popular. Yeah, I've always felt like, wow, you didn't see me. Mm. I don't see yeah. color. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty dismissive. Yeah. And also, what, what would you do if you did see color? Like, what do you, what's, what's going to happen if you realize I'm Black? What are you going to do? I, it's, it's almost ominous in a way. Well, and I, I feel Suddenly that... Suddenly I have a secret, right? Yeah. The, when you meet a person for the first time, I think most of us, the first thing we do is we try and put them, not consciously, into a category. Is this person like me or not like me? Are they male, female? Are they 
likely from my group, from my background, and we're getting it all from the visual cues of that person, their hair, their skin color, their facial and body features. And whenever someone doesn't fit into a category that we can easily peg them into, we feel a bit uncomfortable. And that's when people ask, especially kids who are of mixed racial ancestry, what are you? <sighs> or when someone is of indeterminate uh, gender identity, it, it messes with people's minds. So this notion that, oh, I didn't, I didn't see that you were a black person, or I didn't notice that, I didn't notice that I couldn't peg you into a male or female binary. You're right. It's a wholesale denial of a fundamental human process, right? So that tells me that's what you're going to do with that process. You're just going to pretend it's not happening, which again brings me back to, well, if you just let it play out, what, what would you do? You know? Well, we'll see if that day ever comes. Probably <laughs> not in our lifetime. All right. I, I grouped together minorities and women. You have two separate entries for those words, but since those are words that commonly are put together, um, I'd like you to read your descriptor for each of them. Okay. Um, can I do women first? It's your show. Yeah, that might you work. You can do that whatever might work. you want. Yeah, I feel like I'm defending my thesis here, but I guess I kind of am. Okay, so uh, here's, here's women. Women and minorities means that all women are white. I know you believe that, but please keep it to yourself. When all you mean is a white woman, say so. I'm not allowed to say the words white women, but you are. Given your obsession with majorities, going forward, when I hear you say women, I'm going to assume you mean Asian women. <sighs> Which... It reminds me of the, the times when the word, the, the pronoun he was intended to include everyone. Oh, when I say he, I mean everybody, not just men. Yeah. And, and it's weird looking back on some of the early, like, historical stuff or political stuff where they're saying all men are whatever, equal or whatever. It's weird because sometimes they're using men to meet everybody and sometimes they're using men to mean men. You gotta step back and remember what was like, oh yeah, right, they really do literally mean men. Uh, here's mainstream. Along with popular and crossover, you use this word to soothe yourself with the idea that all culture starts with you. You appear to believe that you will cease to exist if you are not at the center of everything. We all know better. You are too few and too weird to pass yourselves off as normal. Maybe stop shooting everybody. <laughs> another disclaimer, another disclaimer for people who are hearing these entries out of context. One thing I've heard consistently from readers is that the mixture of hard and soft say, um, makes the book bearable, for want of a better term. It's, um, and this is, uh, some of this is not accidental. Some of this is the result of the editorial process. One thing I like about writing, as opposed to just blurting, is that what I'm able to say is nuanced and balanced. Once you, once you take it out of context, it loses some balance. But the consistent response feedback I've gotten from people about the overall experience of reading this book is that a certain, a certain readership, right? There are people who, who, who can remember the last time they were said, they were told each one of these words and, and, and all of the barbs feel good because they were thinking them at the time and didn't say them. The other half of the readership, um, I think what I've been told is that the pacing is good in terms of we might be we might be skewed towards some of the more heavy-handed entries tonight. <laughs> the humor that's, is that's fine. Yeah, but humor is very important. I think people are able to hear things easier. That's not to say that you can't talk about serious things and use humor as part of the delivery. And I think that a lot of comedians are very successful when they are able to do that. 
to talk oh. about racism, sexism, homophobia, and they put it into jokes. And sometimes, you know, the line of where it becomes offensive and when it really just raises your awareness. And we all laugh nervously because there's that truth that we recognize, but it's an uncomfortable truth. So that is one of the things I super appreciated from this little book, that there is so much humor in it. I am looking at the um, question board and it says, can you explain a little bit more about the implications of the term grandfathered? Sure. My understanding is that uh, grandfathering was a way of perpetuating uh, discrimination and harassment to wit, uh, for example, you could vote if your grandfather could vote. This was clever back then. So uh, there was a time when, you know, uh, Article One of the Constitution uh, counts us for, for representational purposes, Black people, us as, as three-fifths. And so you go from there. So every call back to that time, you're kind of incorporating or, or, or reviving that earlier era. So that was, that was a, a cute way of perpetuating the disenfranchisement of Black people. Theoretically, you were eligible. But if two generations ago, uh, you wouldn't have been, you're still not. I think of it a little bit like affirmative action for alumni children. They're kind of grandfathered in. They have a preference to go to a school. Yes. Because their ancestors were yes. alumni of those schools, and those schools didn't allow people of color to enter. So they've got an advantage. Anyway, thank you for the question. When, if ever, do you call out people using these words is another question. Not often. Uh, maybe that's why I, I needed to write the book, because usually I'm trying to do something. I'm at work or I'm trying to function. and It's not my job to call out or educate every well-intentioned person who innocently says something ignorant. So not often. Um, it, it, my stock answer to the small talk question, what kind of name is Smire, is some schmuck named Smire thought he could own another human being. But that's because I find that question to be so revisionist that I have to say something. You're asking me a question, but I'm supposed to say, oh, it's, it, no, you know, you know how I got this name. And we're pretending that you don't. And that's crazy because we're not even talking about that. We're at a party, we get the little sausages and then you're asking me to deny your history. And I'm like, no. So that's an exception. Usually I just kind of, hmm. And now since the book has come out, when people say these things to me, like really since I wrote it, uh, when, when someone says something, I'm like, ah, page 54, and it goes down a lot easier. And that's actually why I wrote the book is so that other people can just kind of remember. It's a thing, you know, yeah. it's a thing. It's not, it's not invisible and it's not just you. Yeah. It's such a thing that someone collected them into a book that you have uh, in your, on your desk. You know, I, that's what I like about it. I do sometimes call people on it, but in a, you know, in a kind and gentle way. And you also have to be sensitive. Is it better to speak to someone privately and say to them, you know, when you use the word, whatever, I'm not comfortable with that. Right. I remember I was in uh, I was with a friend and she was referring to an employee, this was a white friend, and she said, I should have known when I hired her that she was just white trash. And I said, I'm not comfortable with that word. Um, you know, she's a person. She had no, no control over what her life circumstances were, right? And, um, you know, I didn't ruin our friendship, but it's hard to bring bring yourself to say something and sometimes you and it was just the two of us it would have probably been different if we had been in a group uh, because you want to be respectful of other people and it's it's you just have to sort of read read the situation i don't think there's one answer for how to handle it but i do think it's important to make people aware of how their language may be falling on your and other people's ears. And now we have 
a book to refer them to. And well, by and, the way, you, and, many and, of and, go ahead. No, no, please. You know, even though it's what not to say to your black friends, a lot of this also applies to other people of color. Absolutely. And, and a slur is different. Right, I, I'm, I'm deliberately, there, there are some that kind of approach the line in the book, but I'm not talking about, I absolutely support, you know, call outs. And I think that they are most effective within a small group of friends. I think it's, it's important when it comes from the inside, the, the real magic in terms of fighting patriarchy for me is when it's like three dudes talking and one person, you know, they, they try it. And the other two guys are like, dude, you know, that's, that's a that's a moment you know and i'm not and that's i'm all for that whenever it's necessary but the onslaught of these i mean i guess that's why they call them microaggressions but it doesn't necessarily mean they're small just numerous you know the legion of aggressions that one encounters every day it's 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 how you get labeled angry, which is a, another one of these in, in the book. And you just, I guess that's my point: is that the onus is not on us to uh, fix each time a person is um, happily perpetuating something that's actually quite violent. I, I, a comment caught my eye. What's worst? about white trash is that it assumes most trash isn't white. So they had to add this to the adjective. It specifies, right. Ooh. Also white trash implies something extremely racist as in white people are automatically better than other people, but some of them are trash. Probably Adam <sighs> can say that better. Woo. No, that's true. Like you've fallen, you, you haven't, you haven't, you, you were given this amazing thing and you fell like Icarus because you had this amazing white skin, but you're not a, you're not a good person. So you're, oh, oh, it's, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, man. Okay. Man, time's just flying. It's already, uh, we have only 15 minutes before what? we, well, no, 15 minutes before we open it up to Q&A. No, no, no. We've got, we've got a little more time. All right. So the word pronounce. I had to ask you about that because my play is called, why would I mispronounce my own name? Names are a form of, names are weaponized against this Kamala Harris. Her name is gonna be mispronounced so much on purpose. I learned how to say Buddha judge and people couldn't bother saying Kamala. Um, Irma, when I wrote this one, I thought of you. This one, this one is dedicated to you. This one was Thank like, you. oh, Irma will like this one. It's just, <laughs> yeah, yes, this one, this one is for you. Pronounce. Don't complain to me that you don't know how to pronounce Kwame or spell in Zinga. Motherfucker, your name is Seamus O'Shaughnessy. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I laughed so hard when I read that one. Thank you so Good. much, Adam. Mission I accomplished. really appreciate it. Mission accomplished, which brings us to the million dollar word racist. <laughs> it's still worth it. It's only worth a million. It used to be worth 12 billion and now it's all right. Racist. Oh. All right. Who no one on this call is. Um, racist. Once upon a time, the word racist meant racist. And then a racist became some sort of boogeyman that would make Steve Bannon look moderate. You would never call someone a racist no matter what they did. Like, you would have to catch someone in a Klan robe trying to light a cross with wet matches before you even considered the possibility that you were looking at an actual racist. And then, maybe not even then, see ignorance, which is another one we could talk about. You started calling Nazis the alt-right at their request. Today, racist means a person who points out when racism is happening right in front of them. You can add racist to the list of words that have been killed this century, along with literally and ironic. And you can keep it to yourself. That is such a charged word in the ears of white people. To call someone or to say that someone 
did something that is racist is like the biggest insult that you could imagine. No matter what they did. Yeah. <laughs> Ijoma Lua in her book, So You Want to Talk about, about Race, mentions that President Bush said in his memoir that one of the low points in his life was when Kanye West called him a racist. And I thought, wow, that was some easy life he's had. Um, <laughs> and, and, and a friend just shared this story. Okay, in the San Francisco Bay Area, Mill Valley is a very beautiful little bucolic town, very wealthy. They live in Mill Valley and they were going hiking in one of the fire trails up on Mount Tam and they saw a woman in a Range Rover park and partially block the fire lane and the fire hydrant. And they said to her, excuse me, you can't park there because you're blocking the fire lane and the hydrant. And she says, oh, I parked here a million times. And they said, no, you, you can't park here. It would impede an emergency vehicle. And she said, why don't you mind your fucking business? You're nothing but a bunch of Karens and Kevins. Do you even know what that is? Or are you too damn old to know it? And then she said, you're nothing but racists. Why don't you call, why don't you call the police? Maybe they'll come and they'll shoot me. And she said, I'm going to take your picture and post it on next door. Was this a black woman who? who no, had she was a white in? woman in a Range Rover. A white woman in a Range Rover. And and the people that she was attacking were were also were white. white. These were all white people. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it reminds me when my my son was ten years old. He had some little friends in his car from his soccer team, and they were talking about dogs. And I said I didn't like dogs and. This little 10 year old said, Irma, that's so racist. That's awesome. But it's even, I mean, like, I kind of get that. People who don't like cats a little bit to me are racist, but, but that's so complicated. That's, I guess that's how they get down in Mill Valley. <laughs> well, they said that they were just blown away that this woman took their picture because she planned to post it. And then they took her picture, which uh, led to the call the police so they can come shoot me. And she, of course, gave him the universal F.U. sign. And so I look at this picture and I go, yeah, that's a white woman. I that's just what. bananas. I mean, maybe she didn't really know what any of those terms were. I have a buddy whose mom doesn't know what Rickrolled means. And to this day, she still uses it like incorrectly to mean I, I don't not exactly sure what she thinks it means. But uh, maybe that's Can what she Can you tell she me thought. what Rickrolled means? It's an old thing from the internet where you'd click a, a link and it was a, a Rick Astley video, never going to give you up. And you didn't know that's what it was going to be. So when you're watching him do his bat, then you're like, oh, I got Rick rolled. But she uses it. I don't know, like if she had a box of candies and she ate the first one and it was nasty, she'd be like, oh, I just got Rick rolled. So maybe that's how uh, angry Mill Valley bad White Parker woman. was using Karen. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's a was, lot. It was very bizarre. Uh, it that, was very there's, even, there's even more to unpack there than <laughs> Kanye West calling W a racist. That's, that image is going to haunt me. Okay, when you got to watermelon, <laughs> I thought, oh, no, not watermelon. <laughs> no, I'm that's just, my I'm, favorite I'm fruit. I'm harshing your buzz, huh? That's my favorite fruit. I said, uh-uh, not watermelon. I'm going to keep saying it. Go you ahead. What do you do say? Do you. You draw the line. <laughs> So, but that reminded me that a friend of mine, a black woman writer, told me that when she was 12 or 13, her Sunday school teacher in her all black church told her that she told the whole class, all black kids, that they should never eat fried chicken, ribs, or watermelon in the company of white people. <laughs> Chris Rock, uh, during his show, had a sketch that purported to be a commercial for a little kid. I know some of you out here remember this. Uh, disguises for black people to put their watermelons in at the supermarket so they wouldn't be judged. There was one that was like a little dog costume with some wheels on it so you could pretend it was a, a little little terrier. There was like the baby thing. You could, you could smuggle your watermelon out like it was a baby. It was hilarious. 
<laughs> well, I want to turn to your book, Knucklehead. Oh. And, I want, and, and especially, I love that book. I think it should be made into a movie. So when you get the rights to the movie option, you let me know, because I'm so excited about that happening. I also want to know if you've got another novel in the offing, planning, in process. It's all up here. I mean, all right. yeah, I yeah. hear you. I, I, have hear. An, I have more books in me. Um, I'm, I'm working on some stuff now that the, the, the queue, the backlog is significant because, you know, there's like, you know, you write something and then you promote it and then you write. And so I'm busy. I would be very surprised if this was the last thing I did. Oh, I, I better not be. I would be very <laughs> disappointed if it was. Well, I love the book because it gave me an opportunity to vicariously live inside your protagonist's head. He was a black lawyer in San Francisco and he's going through his day just dealing with stuff from all sorts of places. People at his law firm, people on Muni, Latino guys calling him the N-word in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I spend so much time being exhausted and infuriated thinking, if I were Marcus, I'd be ready to explode every single minute of the day, which he pretty much was. <laughs> and I kept thinking, no, don't go there, don't go there. But you were invited as a result of that wonderful book, you were invited to uh, read about and present at the book festival in Cape Town a couple of years ago. And you wrote an essay for the Johannesburg Review of Books about the trip. And it was about your first venture outside of the United States. And you said the following, I have no interest in spending my vacation days sampling the nuances of anti-blackness around the globe. There's enough on my plate here in the US and my lifelong emergency overseas survival plan of yelling, I'm an American, until someone whisks me to safety has been dubious for a while now. The other thing I loved in that particular um, essay, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing, is you said, I will always love Africa because from the minute I arrived, it treated me like a white girl. I'll always be grateful to the Open Book Festival in Cape Town for uh, having me out to discuss my book because I, I would not have gotten around to it and now it would be twice as complicated, right? So, um, yeah, I got a lot more than I bargained for out of that trip. I, I was, I escaped the treatment for one week and it changed me. Yeah, I love uh, that essay and I recommend all of you read it. It's on your website, adamsmeyer.com. And um, I, I, I think it's in your essay where you say that you made a bunch of friends on Twitter. People, you met people there who are now connected with you on Twitter. And that's so that when you see a tweet with a black man's image, say what, say what comes to your mind. Well, it was just, it was nice to, to uh, be following some people who sometimes, if, you know, on my feed, if I saw a picture of a smiling black person, they, they weren't the latest black person to be murdered by the police. It was the minister of finance or somebody who just won an award or something. It just, kind of opened up another world to me. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember when I read that, I thought that's so sad when uh, we live in a society where most of the images we see of ourselves are negative, that our expectation is that we're gonna see something we don't wanna see. We Edmund see Perry was the first, the, the first time I saw a graduation photo in the paper and the kid was already dead. His name was Edmund Perry. I was in New York, I was young, um, and he was the first one that I noticed. Not the last. I mean, hell, George Floyd wasn't the last by half, uh, by far. Um, but Edmund Perry was the first one. I saw that smiling graduation photo in that context. And I was like, oh, oh, that's, didn't see that coming. Yeah, yeah. Wow, there's so much more that I want to talk to you about, but we're going to go to the questions. Uh, but I want to ask you one thing. What do you think will come from the massive support for Black Lives Matter and the willingness of millions of people of pallor and not Black people and non-Black people 
to actually be willing to engage in a conversation and to take some action of various forms to address anti-blackness. What are you thinking about what we might see? Oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's atypical that there are so many non-black people that are putting their lives on the line and putting themselves in harm's way. I think it's remarkable. A little bit, I think it almost proves the point how much more strongly it resonates when a white person gets their head cracked open. But I guess that's part of, that's part of the action. That's part of, that's part of why they're doing it. And it's, I, I do not feel um, dismissive of that at all. I feel appreciative of that. Of course, the, the pushback is absolutely biblical. And so I have no idea what's going to happen. Honestly, I don't think any of us uh, are going to know what next year looks like until January 20th or so. I'll tell you what I feel good about. I feel good about these Confederate statutes that, that toppled. There was one in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, that Hurricane Laura took care of. The city fathers had just voted to keep it up, but the hurricane had other plans. We have sports franchises that have said they would never consider changing the disparaging names, the slurs of their team, and they're going to do it. Colin Kaepernick four years ago took a knee and not too many people in the sports world came out uh, in his support. And today they shut down the NBA and other sports. And I think that there's, I think real changes are possible. So yes, and also black people are still being murdered at the same alarming rate as we were a year ago. So I guess the thing that concerns me is it's um we're in a we're in a, a pivotal moment I guess in 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 my mind because all of this could lead to significant change, but if it doesn't, then this is the new normal. It's almost worse than if the movement hadn't happened at all. And the only analogy that I can think of is it's like the, the first time your boyfriend hits you, right? So you either leave or you don't, or you, you know, you either, there, there's, a, there's a way that you handle it that creates change one way or the other, or now you have a boyfriend that hits you sometimes, right? So the horrors that we're seeing if they don't end, they are now the baseline. You know, we've gotten used to snuff videos. We're watching public executions in real time with people all around screaming and stop and guys just looking dead in the camera like what? I mean, that's where we're at now. So whether we stop being there because we are there, I don't know. I hope so. Because where we are now is a fucking nightmare. Yeah, it is. It's pretty scary. It's pretty ugly. All right, let's look. Let me see what questions are out there. I think we've answered them. Ooh, good. Uh, I want to ask you about the term BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, <sighs> People of Color. Uh, and how you feel about that? I am not the one to ask that for generational reasons. Um, I'm not super trying to keep up with, I've, I've seen so many terms come and go. I'm not really trying hard to keep up with that. I don't even always capitalize black. You know, I just, I feel like the substance is more important. It's kind of what I was just saying a minute ago. As long as they're killing black people for fun, I don't care what you call us. And conversely, if they ever stop killing black people for fun, I don't care what they call us. Yeah, I, I get asked about the word Latin X and how mm -hmm. I feel about that. And I go, you know, if people wanna use it, that's fine. I consider myself Chicana. Latinos come from many, many different backgrounds. Many of us, even if we're generations removed from the country of origin, usually identify with that country. But Latinx is an attempt to be all inclusive. And I, I once used the word minority with a friend of mine and he said, 
you mean the majority of the global world? And I said, yeah. I do. <laughs> but if I use that, <laughs> are people going to know what I'm talking about? Because language is about communication, right? So it's about finding a word or words that really tell people what you mean. Which brings me, you mentioned the word microaggression early. I have several words that bug me. And one of them is politically correct, microaggression, and triggered. I don't use those words. I know a lot of people use them a lot. Uh, when I hear them, I usually ask follow-up questions of the person because I want to know what it is they're seeking to ask or to say. Do you have words like that? Oh, well, they're all in that, here. That, that, right? aren't I mean, in book, that aren't in the book. That aren't in the book. Those that are in the book. You know, my understanding is that the term microaggressions was coined by a deeper thinker than me. I understand it. I tend not to use it, perhaps it's another term that's been co-opted. Um, maybe there's more of an emphasis on the micro part than there was initially. Um, yeah. Same for triggered. I, I, I totally get triggered. We need, we need, it's like ally, right? We need words that serve those functions. I think sometimes also our side is um, a little susceptible to having our words twisted and going with it. You know, um, the term political correctness has had a long and convoluted history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there was a time when it served a specific purpose and then it got and then we were told it was meant something else. And right, a lot of us right. believed that. Yeah. Right. So uh, honestly, I think they're, 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 I think our side uh, has a tendency to take things at face value. And maybe we consider that a virtue, but I think it's being used against us. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I can elaborate on that any more than that mm -hmm. right now, but mm -hmm. it applies. I, I do see a question. Are there any words that were left on the cutting room floor? And if so, any chance of seeing some B-sides? B-sides would be awesome. As it turned out, nothing got cut. I, I, I was over-inclusive. I, I wrote about every word I could think of and sent it to my publisher and agent and friends with the expectation that, some, that, that there'd be a consistent feedback that certain terms didn't resonate. Apparently, everything in this book resonated for a significant uh, segment of my readership, and everything stayed in. There are also more than, there's more than one way to say things. There is, um, time permitting, I'm going to read another short one. There is a, an And entry. then there is another question I want to ask you. Okay. The, okay, so the entry is B, B-E, the word B. Don't speak Ebonics to us. Don't try to speak what you believe to be our language. Don't say they be like, say they're all like, like a normal person. Keep that be shit to yourself. And so there, there are other entries in the book that just say CB, like the, you know what I'm saying? It says CB, right? And, and, and one that I wish I had, even if it just referred back to CB is my bad, because I guess not surprisingly, since this book came out, I've had a lot of white people telling me, my bad, and <laughs> it really does deserve to be in here. <laughs> okay, so page 37, someone says, can we talk about page 37? Hair. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm getting some pushback on some of these. I'm getting some pushback on the hair thing. And, and to, the, to the, the hair thing, I will say, and this is true of a lot of these. This is, this is what we've been talking about a lot uh, during this conversation. A lot of these terms are, I mean, some of these terms have bloody roots, but some of them are not inherently hateful or evil. It's how they've been used over time. It's centuries of the same conversation, same tired conversation, when you're just trying to get your work done and go home, right? The, the, these conversations have overstayed their welcome to the point that don't even talk to me about it. <laughs> okay. When one person says, y'all, my best friend growing up had a white mom from Oklahoma, so I learned to say y'all from her. 
Texans, Tejanas, we say you all all the time. I'm going to keep using it, Adam. I got already got some pushback <laughs> from you on that. And look, and I said, okay, so for y'all, I wrote, you know, C, B, but then I also wrote Southern white people seem to come by their y'alls honestly, albeit violently. I spent some time in Baton Rouge recently because of the Gaines Award thing, and, and I heard some of the most spectacular y'alls I've ever heard from white people. I was born and raised in New York City. You know, that's, there, there are people from the Great Migration who brought it with them. But when you're in a restaurant in Baton Rouge and, you know, a white woman says, you know, y'all want some gravy on that, you can't dispute. The authenticity just shines through you. This, no, I agree. Okay, so here's a question that I was going to ask you but didn't get to is, what else do you recommend people read to enlighten themselves? And I know that a lot of people of color are tired of being personal Googles for our friends. Tell me what I should read. Tell me what I should do. I want to be part of solving the problem. I want to educate myself about how not to be racist, how to treat people fairly. I mean, I guess in a word, I'd say empathy, but it's a really good question to ask me when I'm right here. And I could, I could say all of these. I'm going to say this book has so much to do with my book. Um, yeah, re read this one next. I mean, whoever's asking that, is, you, can't, you can't go wrong with Citizen. <laughs> Yeah, I read recently um, a bit of James Baldwin, and I thought, oh, my God, he could have written it yesterday. Yes. Sad, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. He could have written it yesterday. Oh, All right. so, much, so many reading lists online. But, but that, was, that was my gut reaction when I heard the question. That was my... Uh. Okay, let me see if I've left anything out. Have you considered a collaboration with InStar YouTube content producer to make these into a series of hilarious videos? I have now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're about uh, three minutes from the closing. So is there something you'd like to tell folks about your work, your book? Oh, got a new website. You mentioned adamsmeyer.com has got a lot of, um, you know, some previous work that you can access, uh, events coming up, archived events in the past. This uh, book tour, it, it, it's virtual, of course, but it's been pretty intense from the get-go. Um, yeah, check it out. Check out my website and go from there. Yeah, your writing is, is fabulous. I just love reading what you write because it's insightful, it's funny, it's thought provoking. So I recommend both your books and your essays. And I recommend your shows. Enough about me. Irma Herrera is a towering giant of talent. And here's my evidence of that. She's got more than one Southern white lady accent. I caught that. <laughs> I caught that. I don't know how many times I've seen your shows, but these were, she was channeling, she was channeling men, she was channeling women, she was channeling these distinct, fully realized people. It, it, the, it, a, a, one, a solo show is never easy, but the, all, the gloves were off as far as you covered the whole world. I've seen that show at least three times because I did the talk back three times and there was something new in it every time, even not the new material, even the stuff I was hearing again, the writing, the performance, you, you pulled it off and I'm oh, buying whatever you so you're much. selling. Thank you so much. Who knows when I'll be back on stage, but in the I meantime, know. I have my stairwell theater, which are these four to eight minute snippets telling stories about names. The next one is going to be about hurricanes. Where do they get their names? When Hurricane Irma was uh, around in 2017, my friends were all calling me and saying, they're so upset, they're mispronouncing my name. And I said, oh no, it's fine. Hurricane Irma is an angry white woman. That's her name, Irma. <laughs> yeah, don't call so her I don't take it personally. <laughs> yeah, watch out for Hurricane Karen. Yeah, oh gosh. And, you know, <laughs> I don't know if there has been a Hurricane Karen. 
but there's already a list. There's a list of names that rotate every six years for the hurricanes in the Atlantic coast. Oh, I didn't the know Atlantic that. Ocean. I'll post I don't know where they were getting those from. But your, yep. your blog posts are, are special. Thank um, you. I love being on your email list. People should Thank get you on so much. her email list. Yeah, so Irma Herrera, I R M A H E R R E R A dot com. And you can uh, watch uh, Sizzle Reel of my one woman show. And you can also subscribe to my blog and see my little stairwell teatro performances. Awesome. So there you have it. Anyway, I have us at 530. So I don't know if Katie's going to come on and Greenlight Bookstore. And there she is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam and Irma, for that great discussion. Um, and thanks to everybody for being here. If you missed any of tonight's event or just want to watch it again, we will be posting it to our YouTube. Um, so please look out for it there. And don't forget to buy your copy of Adam's book in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. Thanks so much to you both, and thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Greenlight. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for